All right, guys, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, it's great to see such an, a, a wonderful turnout here. Um, I think it really underscores the kind of interest we have here at Notre Dame in contemporary China, contemporary Chinese politics and, and global affairs. So uh, it's, you know, it's great to see all of you here. My name is Professor Joshua Eisenman. Um, I work on Chinese politics, U.S.-China relations. Um, and I think we need to begin by thanking the Liu Institute for hosting this excellent event, for bringing Sam here and the director, Michelle Hawks, uh, who has been so supportive uh, of, of my work and the, and the work we're doing here in contemporary China. Um, it is a particular pleasure for me uh, to host uh, uh, Professor Sam Zhao because he's been such a, an important mentor and friend and exemplar for me in my work over the years. Um, he, he created uh, the journal of uh, contemporary China, um, uh, and, which is the leading journal in the field. And um, I guess, you know, I should mention that that he published my first ever uh, uh, peer reviewed article. Right. Um, so, that, you know, certainly that <laughs> touches a place in my heart. Um, but but he also has blurbed my last two books, both in English and in Chinese. Um, and uh, my work has just cited his extensively numerous times. So so I'm an admirer and a friend and uh, and grateful to Sam uh, for his leadership and his support uh, to me in my career. So it's wonderful uh, to introduce him here. Um, so. Uh, Sam Zhao is a professor uh, at the uh, uh, University of Denver and director of the Center for China-U.S. Cooperation at the Joseph Corbell School of International Affairs. As I mentioned, he is the founder and the editor of the Journal of Contemporary China. His new book, which is on sale outside, right? Here it is, here it is everybody. Here it is, here it is. I've been instructed I must return this immediately, so it's not my copy. Um, is, is on sale outside, published by Stanford University Press, The Dragon Roars Back. Transformational Leaders and Dynamics of Chinese Foreign Policy. Um, so Sam holds a PhD uh, from UCSD. Um, he holds uh, an MA uh, from the University of Missouri, and he holds both a BA and an MA from a little school called Peking University. Um, so Sam is uh, just a top scholar and a top voice in the field. And, and after this, he's got a bunch of media appearances that he's got to go to. So he's, he's truly a leader, and we're really blessed to have him here. So without uh, further introduction, let me uh, invite Sam to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua, for the friendship and also uh, for the invitation to this wonderful institution to see some good friends and also thank the new institution for hosting me uh, for the book, book talk. Uh, that, uh, the, the book uh, title is uh, The Dragon Rolls Back, Transformational Leaders and Dynamics of Chinese Foreign Policy. So when you give a book talk, the first question people ask you uh, is always is, why do you write this book? So my answer to this question is uh, two thoughts. One is um, empirical, the other is theoretical. Empirically, I'm teaching, I've been teaching a course called The Making of Chinese Foreign and Security Policy for many years. Uh, I have tried to find a single volume and that could cover the whole 70 plus years of the PRC uh, history of uh, foreign policy making uh, and uh, with a coherent uh, framework. But I have not found it because uh, most of those folks are what I called in my book, uh, unidimensional and static. When I said that, meaning that most books are uh, on very narrowly focused on bilateral relationships of China with certain countries or certain geographical areas uh, on certain issue areas during certain uh, periods. But uh, comprehensive covering of uh, uh, the whole 70 plus years of PRC history is a mysteriously lacking. So as a self-promotion, I tried to write a book which is historically in depth and up to date to discuss the transformation of the Chinese foreign policy in the last 70 plus years. Theoretically, I found two theories have been used most often to explain Chinese foreign policy behavior. One is the people called structures uh, realist theory, which emphasizes or focuses on so-called relative power. It 
argues that uh, when a country's relative power expands, its ambition expands. Uh, increasingly powerful China would inevitably, inevitably here to redefine its national interests uh, in relationships with its neighbors, and also inevitably challenge the U.S. dominance in the global stage. Uh, this theory has been used mostly to explain the recent uh, assertive behavior of China in the last couple of decades. But if you apply this theory to the last 70 years, you find problems because uh, when China's relative power was weak during the early PRC period, Mao Zedong's years, China was very aggressive. China was very confrontational. And China, in my book, I documented China's uh, wars. China fought six wars during most years, including the war with the most powerful nation on the earth, the US in Korea. China power was relatively weak at that time. China power was constrained. China fought war also with the Soviet Union, fought war with India, so many countries. But its power, relative power was not that strong. China moderated its foreign policy behavior when Deng Xiaoping came to office, but China's relative power did not change that much during Deng Xiaoping's years. His successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, continued Deng Xiaoping's moderate foreign policy. But China's power, relative power, increased dramatically during those years. China was regarded as the rising power. Xi Jinping came to office, shifted Chinese foreign policy orientation again from moderation to more confrontational, but China's relative power, China economy slowed down. China's relative power was not increased that much in, China, in Xi Jinping's 10 years. And people argue, people have argued that Xi Jinping's foreign policy, in fact, that's also, I agree with that, have overreached. We talked about that this morning, overreached. When I say overreach, I meant it said foreign policy objective beyond the reach of its relative power, its strength. So this theory, structural realist theory, cannot help us understand these non period of PRC foreign policy behavior. The second theory has been used most often to uh, explain Chinese foreign policy behavior, so-called regime type theory. It attributes China's so-called aggressive behavior to its authoritarian regime. In other, word, in other words, China's foreign policy behavior cannot be changed until a regime change takes place. But China's authoritarian regime has not changed in the last 70 years. China's foreign policy behavior has shifted many times. As I mentioned earlier, even you put in a small periods, the shift is many, many times turns shifts. So in that case, I tried to develop a, my own theoretical framework to understand uh, Chinese foreign policy behavior, which is uh, so-called a leadership-centered uh, framework which argue, I argue in my book that uh, leaders matter in all political systems, but in authoritarian totalitarian systems matter much more. In democracies, leaders are constrained by term limits, by oppositional parties, by public opinions. In China's Leninist authoritarian system, the emphasis, where the emphasis is discipline, hierarchy, in the Chinese term, democratic centralism, the leaders at top has a lot of power. They are, not, they are relatively unchecked by public opinions, by term limits, by uh, oppositional parties. The question here for me is that uh, not every leader in the PRC history has used that authoritarian, 
or unlimited, unchecked power to chart a new direction for Chinese foreign policy. By official account, the PRC has been led by five generations of leaders, represented by Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping. They missed three, Hua Guofeng, Hu Yaobang, and Zhao Ziyang. So I put these eight leaders together, try to understand the, how they have ex exercised their power. And in that context, I distinguish them into three types of leaders. One is so-called transformational leaders. These leaders have visions and political wisdoms to navigate the jungle of a PRC, a power jungle PRC politics, mobilize domestic and external resources to advance their foreign policy or even domestic policy agenda and chart a new course. Who are the transformational leaders? I identified Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and Xi Jinping. Mao Zedong, he developed a very unique cause of Chinese foreign policy in my book. I use the revolutionary foreign policy. In the Chinese official terminology, in Xi Jinping's technology, he made China strong, uh, made China independent, stand up. And Deng Xiaoping developed what I call developmental foreign policy to make China rich. And Xi Jinping, he developed what he himself called big power foreign policy to make China strong. The second type is so-called transactional leaders. These leaders may stay in power, indeed they stay in power, but they and state on cause set by their predecessors. Who are those trans transactional leaders in the PRC? Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. They each stayed for 10 years and two terms in office, but they stayed on cause set by Deng Xiaoping. The third type I called failed leaders. They might have new visions. In fact, uh, I will say uh, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang had new visions. But who cares? You lost power. You lost power in the jungle of PRC politics. You cannot prevail. And uh, my books try have uh, tried to document. I'm focused on the transformational leaders, try to document how each of the three transformational leaders have uh, developed their new visions and uh, established their personal or office authorities and uh, uh, reconstructed domestic environment. When I said domestic environment, I'm talking two aspects. One is ideational. I focused on how to reconstruct the historical memories and uh, mobilize nationalist uh, aspirations. The second part of a domestic uh, resource is a uh, structure, intuition, restructuring structure, uh, policy making intuitions to uh, fit into their vision. On the international aspect, uh, uh, I talked about how they exploit global power distribution and also those international regimes, norms, rules to advance, to serve their foreign policy agenda and also advance their vision. But today's talk, I will not talk about this. If I talk this, you will not buy books. <laughs> <laughs> so I will talk about foreign policy making or power concentration by Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping, very contemporary, very current. And what are the foreign policy implications of his foreign policy making uh, 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 power concentration or centralization? Here, before I got to that 
point, we have to uh, give you some little bit background. Uh, the power of foreign policy making, or any policy making in PRC, especially foreign policy making, is very, very centralized in the hands of uh, paramount leaders. But they are supported by a hierarchy at three levels. Uh, one is a decision making institutions, Politburo, I mean, Central Committee, Common Party Central Committee. But Central Committee does not meet that often, once a year. So, Politburo, Politburo, Central Committee, they meet frequently, make decisions on behalf of the Central Committee. So, these are policy making institutions. The second level, Chinese called basically is a policy coordination and elaboration organizations. These are OPEC institutions and work behind the scenes in an interdepartmental manner to assist top leaders in the final decisions of foreign policy, of policy in the broad sense. And the third level is uh, nine bureaucracies in the party, government, and the military. Each of the three leaders I studied have uh, different leadership styles to uh, work with this hierarchy. Mao Zedong, as a founder of the PRC, uh, has a very strong personal authority, and uh, uh, I called him a crusader. And uh, he made strategic and security policy decisions uh, top down. He hit bureaucracy. He really did not want to deal with bureaucracy. So he delegated his um, trusted lieutenant, premier, so in that he was also concurrent foreign minister to deal with bureaucracy. In fact, he's built the first coordination institution called uh, MS7 in 1958. Uh, one of them was a uh, foreign leadership, foreign affairs leadership small group to coordinate, to work to cut through bureaucracy. Deng Xiaoping had a totally different style. He was a pragmat pragmatic strongman, I call that. He was consensus builder. He dedicated authorities to, I mean, let me step back a little bit. He never held top power position. What was highest position he had? Vice premier. But he was real, he was true paramount leader behind the scene. So he dedicated those routine policy making authorities to those in the fourth front, Zhao Ziyang, Hu Jintao, I mean, Hu Jintao, uh, Hu Jiaobang, those people, and also bureaucracy. He ratified their decisions if they can reach consensus. He let them back decisions. If they reach consensus, he just automatically ratified them. He stepped in if they could not reach consensus. So this kind of dedication by consensus was his work style. In fact, uh, his successors, uh, 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 Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, continued his style to try to have so-called collective leadership and to build consensus. Xi Jinping changed everything. He arguably, I don't know if you agree, the most powerful leader uh, in PRC history because uh, basically he eliminated all his uh, potential rivals at the 20th Party Congress. Li Keqiang died. Now he does not have to worry about any potential so-called rivals. And in that way, he, uh, ups he has upset a uh, non-practice of power balance at the top edge now. Mao Zedong was balanced by his comrades, by Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, if you know PRC history. And Deng Xiaoping was balanced by Chen Yun and the elders. Jiang Zemin was balanced by Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao was balanced by Jiang Zemin, who is now balancing Xi Jinping. I cannot identify any credible balancer or rival today against Xi Jinping. So the decision-making style changed from those consensus build, build, building 
process to what I called she in command model. Everybody is looking at C to his decision. And uh, he has emphasized so-called top-level design from top. He sit at the very top. And uh, even he, I will say, he becomes micromanager. He's chairman of everything. He, he, if he cares, he will just get into anything. If a toilet, public toilet, where should I have a public toilet? He will make that decision. That's his in his style. Micromanager, chairman of everything, top level design. That's Xi Jinping. How Xi Jinping got this powerful? Three triggers that have helped Xi Jinping to quickly consolidate power and build him at very, very as a, the most powerful leader. One was uh, Hu Jintao's and his predecessor, so-called collective leadership, was too weak in many people's elite's mind and too divisive to curb those and to make effective decisions and also curb corruptions. And also for many people in China at that time to basically to um, suppress those liberal ideas, which in many people's mind was uh, a threat to the one party role, common party role. So Xi Jinping presented himself as a strong man up to the challenge that uh, that um, he said unprecedented challenge that to the scale that net collapse of the Soviet Union. China was facing that kind of threat, needed a strong leader. I'm the person, I'm a strong man. To get China out of those threats. So he established his authority with the consent of political elites. I still remember those years, 10 years ago. Many people said, wow, we got it. We got a leader. Especially among the elites, now they are so disappointed. You got what you got. The second was high profile political scandals and corruption cases. We all know at that time, Zhou Yongkang, Bo Xilai, Lin Jihua, those people just said, came, came out at the right time. She didn't mean to overpower 2012. So, took advantage of those political scandals, he launched a wide sweeping anti corruption campaign. On one hand, established his reputation, popularity among the ordinary Chinese people. Everything. Hey, corruption, corrupt officials, he part of those officials got popularity. On the other hand, polish his potential rivals. Third, the, there was, a, after 2008, the Olympic game, and also the financial meltdown in the West, the Chinese elites, Chinese people was filled with a kind of mixed feeling of national pride and frustration. They were so proud of China's accomplishment. Apartment China finally came to the center of the world stage by hosting the Olympic, Summer Olympic 2008. On the other hand, the Western countries are declining, I and mean, they thought it was declining doomed during the financial crisis, but they still try to undermine China's rise. During the Olympic, we all remember those, uh, I mean, uh, Torch, Rene in San Francisco, in, uh, in, in Paris, all those places, and also uh, Tibetan uprising, all those problems, and also the, the, the directors uh, from Hollywood withdrew from the uh, Olympic Committee. They were so frustrated. They thought China deserves or deserves better treatment in the world. So Xi Jinping came to office, proposed what the China dream of national rejuvenation. Wei Da Fu Xing in Chinese. That really, I mean, resonated the, the, the confidence, the assertion, nationalist expression of Chinese people. This is the leader we need. So that's how they, he consolidated his power 
quicken it. His power cons consolidation has been, I mean, intuition, intuitionized at all three levels of foreign policy making intuitions. This is the chart I put and uh, policy making intuitions, policy coordination intuitions and uh, bureaucracy. Let me very briefly talk about each of the three levels uh, power uh, consolidation. At the policy making intuitions, he basically established personal loyalty to him as the guiding principles among the interactions of uh, political elites. That's what he did. All this, I don't want to get into the uh, details. You can read or you can, you must already know. I want to emphasize on the next two levels. One is uh, policy coordination intuitions, the other bureaucracy, and the policy coordination intuitions. For many years uh, after 1981, and the only foreign policy coordination intuition was Central Foreign Affairs Leadership Small Group. Maybe I should uh, step back on that. I said uh, the, only, the only one since 1981. In fact, that was created, as mentioned, by Mao Zedong in 1957 among the five, uh, uh, five intuitions, coordinating intuitions. But it was disbanded during the Cultural Revolution and restarted in 1981. Then when Jiang Zemin came to office uh, in 1999, there was an embassy bombing event. At that time, people, I remember we studied foreign, Chinese foreign policy, we all was uh, wondering, China's crisis management capacity was so weak. China needed an uh, institution like a U.S. National Security Council in the White House. Then Jiang Zemin, after the embassy bombing, he created national, Central National Security Leadership Small Group to handle those military and national security uh, crises. Then Hu Jintao came to office 2010, around 2010, the Marine Times security issue became so prominent. And uh, so many institutions, nine institutions got involved in the Marine Times security or they call rights protection business. So Hu Jintao created the Central Protecting Marine Times Rights and Interest Leadership uh, sm small group. The problem at that time, many people talked was these institutions, these coordination institutions, lack of staff support. In fact, they the, re, re, the all reunite upon one office called Zhongyang Weiban, Central Foreign Affairs Office, for staff support, all the three. They existed only as ad hoc meetings to have uh, those stakeholders, different ministries, uh, uh, offices meeting at, at a certain time. They could not serve as a regular national security or foreign affairs um, um, policy advisory intuition. Xi Jinping came to office, quickly realized the problem. He did everything to strengthen the central coordination of foreign policy making. The first thing he did was 2013, he established in Chinese. I don't know how to translate. I said, Transnet State Security Commission. Maybe you can uh, Central National Security Commission or whatever, you can use that. But that intuition became so powerful. It's a regular intuition, has a regular staff support, and a very high level, very powerful. And what is more interesting is that it's in charge of both external security and internal security. Basically here, he saw, he, he developed the concept of holistic security. Security is linked, domestic security is linked with internal, uh, uh, external security. So they focus on both domestic security and those inter international threat 
connected to internal security. But you know Xi Jinping, he is uh, more concerned about regime security. He developed those kind of uh, holistic security concepts. You write those documents, 11 aspects of uh, security threats. Most of them are domestic or regime security. So this tuition moved gradually since 2013 toward internal security. Of course, they still work on the internal security, not external security threats, but focused more on internal security. In that case, uh, he upgraded in 2018 the Central Foreign Affairs Small Leadership Group into Central Foreign Affairs Commission. What is the difference between a group and commission? Maybe not that much, but commission is more formal, more bureaucratic. In fact, when it's upgraded into commission, they have regular support of staff. Now, Xi Jinping himself is the chairman. And the Politburo member, Wang Yi, now is the director of the office of the Central Foreign Affairs Commission. That title is so misleading. Now he returned as a minister when Qing Gang disappeared mysteriously. But that office is very powerful and also very bureaucratic, very formal to coordinate foreign policy making. And to coordinate foreign policy, Chinese leaders have regularly convened so-called central work conferences in the all different fields. Foreign affairs, central foreign affairs work conferences were con convened only four times before Xi Jinping. Oh, three times. Um, Mao Zedong, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao each conduct one. Xi Jinping came to office, conducted the fourth Central Foreign Affairs World Conference, then fifth, then Central Periphery Diplomacy Conference. So he commands three. So clear, he tried to coordinate the foreign policy elites or institutions to his agenda to line up their thinking to his agenda so clear and he he even restructured the chinese diplomatic envoys meeting from every five years to an annual meeting they call back those ambassadors envoys to beijing every year to listen to his instruction, to understand his foreign policy agenda. At bureaucratic level, he has politicized and enlarged foreign policy bureaucracies. And Chinese diplomats for many years before Xi Jinping's time, uh, after Deng Xiaoping's years, after Deng Xiaoping came to office, saw themselves and recognized as professionals, foreign policy or diplomatic professionals. But there was a paradoxical transformation of their political status when they become professionals. The more professionalized, the less politically important they became. The post-foreign minister position from a Politburo Standing Committee to Politburo to Vice Premier to State Councilor the morale in foreign ministry before Xi Jinping's years declined. I met a lot of them. Nine hours overseas, did not have an, that much salary. The foreign economic ministry, they got much better deals overseas. And they have served, had to serve so many inventions, so, so many mentors, so many I mean, clients. But their political status were much lower. Xi Jinping came to office, reversed the trend, gave them more resources, increased their political status, 
I mean, 2008, Yang Jiechi became the first in 20 years former foreign minister into the Politburo. Wang Yi at that time was foreign minister, became the uh, um, uh, uh, state councilor. Act, yeah, in office foreign minister, also first time in 20 years. But the price to get more resources and higher political status is you have to change yourself from political, from professionals into political lawyers. The emphasis is no longer professionalism. The emphasis is political loyalty personally to Xi Jinping. Of course, they said to the party, but the core of the party is Xi Jinping to me. That's the price of the bureaucracy. And also they expanded the mandate of the CCP party diplomacy, put them in the forefront. That's what they see, United States, United uh, uh, front department, the ASEAN department, and the propaganda department, central committee. It is so powerful now. It even got more involved in the forefront. I mean, in the uh, in the, on the uh, stage, uh, visible, and also military diplomacy. His predecessors basically lost control of the military. Now he has uh, not only tightened his uh, control over the military, but also promoted military diplomacy. In fact, one example. The uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Office of the Defense Ministry moved up to the International Military Cooperation Office and the CMC, Central Military Commission, himself the chairman. And what are the foreign policy implications of uh, Xi Jinping's power concentration? There are so many. Let me mention a few of them briefly, then we can just, just have a discussion. One is that the uh, he have enhanced institutional support for his foreign, his big power foreign policy objectives. He abandoned, with, as we said, Deng Xiaoping no profile foreign policy and uh, charted a new course of Chinese foreign policy. With those institutional support, he launched one after another new programs. The Renmin Ming Yun Gong Tong Ti, the uh, shared uh, community for the mankind and new type of international relations uh, and uh, one bell, one road, AIB, so many things. So many now it's a global security initiative, global uh, um, uh, development initiative, global civilizational initiative, so many new things. None of his predecessors ever done that because he has all those advisors, all those kind of uh, uh, coordinations, all those uh, bureaucratic support. And uh, in the meantime, he changed the incentive structure of uh, Chinese diplomats from professionals to political lawyers. That means their behavior has changed. That's what we see those so-called wolf warriors, wolf warrior diplomats. Chinese foreign ministry before Xi Jinping's time received those uh, costumes different uh, tablets from the public because they were blamed as a soft bone. <laughs> they give them, eat those uh, costume, you stand up against America. <laughs> no, they recast themselves as a mixture of wolf warrior diplomats. And those Chinese diplomats, I don't recognize them. Wang Yi, for example, the current foreign minister, he was ambassador to Japan. He was a business scholar, Georgetown. So professional, polite, wanted to learn. I met him once or twice. I was impressed at that time. Very polite, modest. Now, he's a top wolf warrior diplomat. You read his behavior, you read his speeches, you look at his performance, totally different person. Yang Jiechi, to Americans, he was uh, I mean, close to uh, Bush family, uh, uh, and Tiger Young. I saw his performance in Alaska, 2021. Totally different person. Because the structure, the incentive structure of those diplomats 
has changed, and the challenge relationship with U.S. has changed. No longer uh, meet U.S. Uh, uh, demand unitarily, uh, unless U.S. also meet China's demands. And with China developed uh, all those uh, anti-American uh, coalition or whatever, and uh, CCP party diplomacy influence operation has increased, uh, and uh, Taiwan issue, all those issues. The second aspect I want to uh, talk is that uh, with unchecked power, basically Xi Jinping has such a huge power concentration, and uh, he, Xi Jinping is not that good strategist like Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong played the games really well to defend China's interests. Xi Jinping was so arrogant and so overconfident. With that confidence, he met China's foreign policy overreached, as I mentioned earlier. And he met enemies all in all fronts in, and causing pushback and resistance from the US, China's neighbors, European Union, all those countries. So China's international environment has become really deteriorated in during ten, Xi Jinping's 10 years of tenure, now 11 years almost. And uh, but Xi Jinping saw that as a different different uh, from different lands. He saw those threat as uh, foreign uh, Americans or foreign uh, those foreign countries did not want to see their uh, 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 did once did not want to see China rise. Would do everything to prevent China from rising. That's his lens. And uh, in that case, he saw China's security interests more important than development interests. During Deng Xiaoping's years, the emphasis was economic development, and Deng Xiaoping set the foreign policy to serve domestic economic objectives. Xi Jinping reversed that. He will use all the economic resources to serve China's security interests, both domestically and internationally. So there, if there is a conflict between security and development, what he will do? Sacrifice development. Even sacrifice domestic stability. That's what I found amazing. He, he's making all the mistakes for security objective. So that increased his tolerance of risks, of escalation and economic pushback from foreign countries, making China's foreign policy more aggressive, more confrontational. I mean, he put, he, I mean, um, wrote out all those anti espionage and all those security laws, really, damaged China's economic environment. His uh, zero COVID policy, all those things really damaged Chinese foreign policy. But for security perspective, regime security and national security uh, per, uh, perspective makes sense to him. So China has become much more today isolated and stagnated. And in fact, uh, although those institutions helped him to advance his agenda, but it could also in the meantime set back his agenda. In fact, uh, Xi Jinping's big power foreign policy in the last several years, I would say last two or three years, really suffered big setback. I mean, I was in Beijing, I showed that, uh, uh, that photo in the uh, Bell Road Initiative uh, 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 Forum in Beijing, last three forums. This year, only 25 heads of state. In the past year, 30 somewhere, much more leaders joined him. Now he could not get any, in this one last week, last month, no single West country leader joined them. So China is in much isolated situation. And uh, Xi Jinping traveled so much in his term, his first term. He traveled more than Obama. He traveled more than Trump, but now he stayed at home. The whole first year, first half a year, he only traveled overseas two days to Russia. Then in August, he went to South Africa for the BRICS summit. He missed the speech. He was supposed to deliver a speech in the leader's forum, did not go. 
He did not go to G20. He did not go to UN Assembly, General Assembly. He's at home now because so many problems domestically. I mean, this kind of a dictator immobilism type of problem because he concentrates so much power. If he does not make decisions, nobody will make decisions in China. And also because he has so many power, he named his all rivals. Those people under him fight among themselves. So he has to find ways to balance all those problems. Finally, uh, Xi Jinping does not have the authority Mao Zedong enjoyed. Why people listen to him? Is that because he accomplished a lot in the last 10 years? I cannot see any accomplishments in the last 10 years he has accomplished. Only thing he accomplished is he centralized so successfully of power to himself. That's the only accomplishment he had. Then why people listen to him? Because of fear. Because of fear of his personal brutalness as a strong leader. What is con consequence of this? People will not tell him the truth. People will not, people will not dare to disagree with him. People will only try to guess what is his mind, try to please him. So Chinese foreign policy making, just like domestic policy making, has come to the point in a bubble echo of chamber. Xi Jinping's mind determines everything. That will bring intended and unintended consequences. For example, people are now talking about if uh, China will attack Taiwan. Nobody knows. Really don't know. 20, 20, 25, 2027. 2030, nobody knows. Only Xi Jinping himself. I don't know he knows at this point. But if he met his mind to attack Taiwan, everyone surrounding him will say, great idea, we can do it in 24 hours. China is not in a position to do that. It will be a disaster for China. But that will be the situation of decision making in China. Just like Vladimir Putin, when he invented Ukraine, many people say, oh, he could not do it. He will not do it. He did that. Xi Jinping will do the same thing if he met his mind. So Chinese foreign policy has become incoherent, irrational, and unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, I will say, I use these uh, four Chinese characters, power concentration, policy politicization, and securitization, and wolf warriorization. I don't know how to put that yeah. English into English. So I just <laughs> said that. Even said that is so awkward. <laughs> okay, so I'll stop here. We have uh, some time to have a uh, discussion. Okay, so we Good job, Sam. Yeah, that was that was great. And I'm sure we've got just a bunch of questions here. So I think here's what I would propose we do, because we, I'm sure we have a few questions here. Why don't we take two or three at a time and we're going to prioritize students first. Now um, you now, now you're in control. No, no, in no, 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 you, no, no, no. You, in you know who are students. Fair enough. Well, fair enough. OK, uh, uh, but uh, but you, you, you've got the harder job. Um, sure. I will answer them. <laughs> Try. All right. So the, the floor is now open. Oh, excellent, excellent. So I, I see uh, a question here in the back. Maybe you could introduce yourself uh, uh, quickly. Um, thank you so much for the awesome presentation. So my name is Jason and I'm a senior at Notre Dame studying economics, political science. Uh, so uh, my question is that uh, since you mentioned a lot of stuff, you know, regarding the centralization of power of China, the trade-off between security and development. So as you can see, like in the past few years that China, a lot of things happened in China. That Xi Jinping secured his third presidency, removal of the you know like previous Chinese premier, and also the fully controlled People's Congress. So, do you see if, if there's going to be like a turning point of like China's foreign policy in the future? As we can see, like China today has been pretty aggressive regarding the foreign policy due to the insecurity. 
But do you think, think is there a potential like turning point in the near future or probably in you know the next 10 years? And what may be the potential causes for the turning points? And what are the implication of the turning points of China's foreign policy? Thank you so much. All right, we get you get your crystal ball, I hope you want. No, I don't have the crystal ball for sure. All right, we'll take another one or two. I thought I saw that one here. Let's see if we have another student first. Uh, all right. Okay. So, all right, this gentleman, and I'm waiting for you students to get your questions ready. Yeah. Anyway, I'm classified as student here, so I do a program before I'm qualified student to ask. <laughs> uh, my question is obviously, can make out I'm from India. Uh, what are the chances? You see, if you see historically, most of the dictators, we would call Xi Jinping as a dictator. There's no denial on that. And most of the dictators survived for long years, 30 years, 40 years. What happens if he also survives like Mao for 30 years to China? And what are the big current domestic problems which are tying him down to the Beijing today? Uh, okay, let's answer his question first. And uh, you want to okay. get more questions? Uh, unless, there, unless there's one more quickie. All right. Yeah, I think we have may have a student behind you here. That's yeah. student too. Yeah. Right. I, I don't know if I can remember all those questions. All right. So I've uh, yeah. So we've got uh, the turning point. Then we've got what if Ma, what if she survives thirty years and. Um, my name is Shuing. I'm a junior um, studying art history. My question is less foreign policy related. I just wonder why you called a book the Dragon Ross back other than the Wolf Warrior because to me they sound pretty different now. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good question. The okay, title sure. Of the book, right. Right. So I think you can take those three. Next, uh, yeah. uh, I don't have a uh, crystal ball for sure. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't see a sudden shift or you called turning point in Chinese foreign policy. Uh, Xi Jinping's foreign policy in the last 10 years has been shifting back and forth. Uh, he uh, was so um, uh, assertive, but now in the last several days, you can see in the last several weeks, he changed very soft tone toward the United States because China economy in trouble. China had a lot of uh, problems internally and also externally. He uh, feel insecure and needed uh, U.S. So he sent out Oliver um, uh, Branch to the U.S. And uh, I uh, I don't know if I uh, guess right what you're talking about. The turning point is that China would launch a wall or something that is kind of sudden uh, change. I don't see that uh, possibility at near future. Uh, and people talk diversion. If you have domestic pro problems, you divert domestic problems into international aggression, which I don't see at this time. Xi Jinping, he he's so tied up to domestic issues, and uh, I don't think he has uh, the the way to, or as has an intention at this time to launch international adventure to uh, resolve his domestic problems. If he launch war. Against Taiwan, Communist Party regime will be over. I was think over over it. They cannot win this war easily or quickly, and it's much more difficult than Ukraine. I mean, U Russians invasion of Ukraine, and uh, so I, I don't see that possibility. Uh, if uh, uh, Xi Jinping will stay in another thirty years, and let me let me add on. What if he what if he doesn't survive? For another year or two, like so, if he survives a long time, or if he doesn't survive a long time, uh, his health, I think, is a concern. We don't know; it's a national security yeah. uh, secret. Nobody knows. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you see, his face last the, uh, year, October, the Twentieth Party Congress. You see, he sat there, and he could not even read the whole political report, which. Supposed to be four hours, he read only two hours, only a abridged version. So I can see his he he his health uh, could be a pro his energy could be a problem. That will answer your question. Yeah. That, that uh, something could happen to him. That would be disaster for China because uh, he has no institutional arrangement for succession. He has not designated a successor, and uh, so it would be chaotic. Uh, situation if he suddenly uh, uh, become ill 
all passed away. Although I, when I was China, a lot of people really hope that will happen tomorrow. And, uh, but uh, we don't know what will happen. I don't know if uh, he can stay over the next 30 years. Yeah, 100 years old. Yeah, he'll be more than 100 years old. Yeah, 100 years. He's a 70 this year. And, uh, but he will try to stay as long as possible because uh, he cut his, he always burned his bridge. And uh, he met so many enemies domestically. If he stepped down when he is uh, still uh, uh, in good health, <laughs> he, will, he will be sentenced. He will be pur- pur- purged by his political rivals, all those family members. You said millions of them purged in the last uh, 10 years. These people will go after him. So he burned his bridge, he cannot retire. But that also is disaster for China. <laughs> Uh, neither way is not good for China. So I don't see it. But my book uh, title, uh, at that time I wrote the book quite a few years ago, I saw China still rising, coming back uh, to the world stage, to the center of the world stage. That's why you the title, The Dragon uh, 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 Rose Back. Uh, Rose Back, meaning they try to let whole world know they are uh, seeking the sort of rightful, rightful place deserved for China. That's the title. And, but the subtitle basically try to tell, I try to focus on the leadership instead of other factors. Other variables are important, structural and uh, ideological and the institutional, all are important. But for me, the key for those transformation, the rising is a leader or leadership. All right, the next, uh-huh. next round of questions. Uh... I think uh, we have two students over here and then we can uh, move to, I guess, a faculty member or uh, maybe Natalie and then Diego. Hi, thank you for this. Uh, I'm Natalie. I'm a freshman. I wanted to ask, um, with regard to your characterization of Xi Jinping, how would you recommend that the U.S. approach bilateral relations, knowing we're dealing with a leader like Xi who is confrontational and aggressive? Would you recommend that we match his assertiveness or make certain concessions to his geopolitical agenda? I will not say concession. Uh, U.S. has... Maybe take one more, Sam? Oh, oh, sorry. One more. uh... Diego. Now, this is a good question, though. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. All this the is the question, question everyone's asked. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Diego. I'm also a freshman. Um, so thank you so much for coming. So it's concerning that 120 countries have China as their main trade partner. And there's even countries from Latin America. So as Xi Jinping tries to make like China back to its glorious times and all of this, um, how do you see the future of this country? For example, he has claimed that by like the 2030s, his military will be the strongest in the world. By 2049, 100 years from when the Chinese revolution ended, like China will get to its peak. So like, how do you see a future in which China is like the most powerful country in the world? And like it can do, it can provide a lot of influence more than the United States in the modern day. And let's answer this yeah, question. The first, yeah. first question, I will not say accommodation, but uh, try to... Uh, work with China to avoid the worst case scenario, which is uh, the escalation of the conflict into a wall. Could either both, either cold wall or hot wall. I think that's the minimum uh, objective to work with uh, Xi Jinping and China. I don't think he wants to have a wall with US either. So that's a common denominator. We could work together. And uh, uh, for that purpose, we have to uh, uh, keep the line of communication open and uh, uh, at all working levels, uh, try to uh, uh, have uh, build roles, like, uh, for example, the military to military communication. Uh, on the open sea, the Chinese uh, ships has cut U.S. ships in the air, Chinese airplane have cut U.S. Those have to be worked out to avoid those... Uh, uh, accidental uh, wall. Beyond that, I think we have to work on the uh, shared interests and uh, manage our problems. Uh, those shared interests, uh, uh, economic inter- interdependency and uh, climate change. China side has not worked on that re- well. We have to convince them. For example, uh, John Kerry went to China in July. He two objectives to work with China. One was to uh, act 
tied the the um, uh, and the climate change objective from 2016 to 1950. China said, "We're not. Uh, we have our own pace. Will not be uh, 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 led by any for." external forces. The second issue John Kerry tried to work with China was to isolate uh, climate change from geopolitical tension. China said, no, uh, we cannot uh, separate climate change collaboration from broader geopolitical cooperation. So those are problems. We could separate them on those shared interests climate change, pandemic, uh, uh, cross-border uh, 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 crimes, drugs, all those kind of problems. And uh, so that's why I argued earlier in the class that uh, uh, US uh, and China relationships, the desecurization, the cybersecurity issues from non-security issues. And we can focus on those security, non-security issues and de-ideologicalization try to separate ideological issues from all other issues. So that's the next uh, level. Basically, uh, the argument here is to work for Ch what China is, not what China wish for. And uh, Xi Jinping is making so many mistakes. As I mentioned, he's concentrating so many powers. Those power concentration guarantees he make mistakes one after another. Zero COVID is a very good example. His economic policy is a very, very big mistake. I emphasize state-owned enterprises at the expense of his private, private sector and uh, ideological control making his people so angry. And uh, so let Xi Jinping do the work for America. He's doing work for, for the America. U.S. cannot change China. Only China can change China. U.S. president cannot change Chinese policy. Only Chinese president can China change Chinese foreign policy. So let him do his the work, the work to destroy China. He's destroying China. Then we'll be in a better position. If you try to agitate China domestic resistance to China, that only generate nationalist, nationalistic sentiments inside China to push back. So that's the problem. Uh, the question oh. Oh, yeah, the future of country. China's huge economy now, second largest economy. Um, people now uh, debating if a uh, China economy is peak. And uh, there are so many different arguments. Now prevailing argument is peak. And China would from now on going down the road. I don't know. Uh, just a couple of years ago, people were um, all talking about uh, uh, when China would overtake U.S. 2025, 2020, 2030, 2029, and this kind of uh, argument all gone. So two extremes are not right, I think. China will not collapse. But China's uh, uh, economic growth, China's uh, uh, power uh, growth is definitely slowed down because of Xi Jinping's mistakes. And China is uh, now uh, basically in a middle income trap. And uh, if the, it does not change its policy direction, I don't think China could uh, get out that trap to become quick, quickly catch up or overtake the United States. So China is a big challenger to US, is a competitor to US, but uh, to a certain extent, uh, China's uh, threat has been exaggerated, both ideologically and geopolitically by the US. For example, Chinese military. Everybody now is a very Chinese military. I talk to people inside of China. They say Chinese military cannot fight the U.S. in Taiwan Street. And uh, uh, you see the, the turnover of the Chinese uh, uh, top uh, military officers, uh, the rocket force, and uh, the equipment department, and now Air Force. Minister of Defense. Uh, yeah, but Minister, he, he's from that uh, equipment uh, uh, group. And uh, uh, why? Uh, other than the official charge of uh, corruption, what I heard was uh, there were two faces people. On the one face, they told Xi Jinping, we can fight, we're ready. 
on the other fans in the private side, no, we cannot do it. How they got to that position? Their jobs are purchased. They pay, paid money to get a job. How can they fight? So China's threat is there for sure. I don't want to downplay play the, the China's threat, but it's not as the US now, a lot of people talk about. So we still can work with China. And uh, just like the, during Cold War, US exaggerated the Soviet threat. And China's threat is also exaggerated. Sam, one point you made I think is worth reiterating is when I was having some meetings with U.S. government officials in the defense sector, they were saying exactly what you said, which is that we could not have achieved so much in Asia with our pivot to Asia without Xi Jinping. Yeah, exactly. So, he's, a, you know, uh, we, he's our best ally when it comes to advancing U.S. military interests. I mean, it was a very frank agreement with what you said a moment ago. In the Chinese internet, if you do a search, accelerator, accelerator, yeah. accelerator is a banned term. A banned term. Yeah, because that refers to Xi Jinping. Accelerate the collapse of Communist Party. <laughs> yeah. Great. I think we've got some more questions. Well, we've got a, a good round here. So John, and then we go to Victoria, and then uh, uh, one of uh, maybe we'll see how these two go, and then we'll see if we can have room for more. Yeah. Thank you for your speech. Yeah. Your Just try to keep them short because we only have yeah. a few more minutes left. Oh, uh, John, you want the the fine? Uh, professor, thank you very much, but also for your speech, but also for giving us uh, your, your training of Professor Eisenman, who's a rising star oh, at Notre oh, Dame. Yeah, he is. Uh, and, no, he's, he's got half his class here. So thank you for, for your work there. But I've always been interested in how the CCP controls China with 1.2 billion people. I, I'm not even sure how many numbers are in the CCP. Could you just spend a little time? Give us a little background on that. How does yeah. that work inside of China? You have 90 million members. Um, yeah. Maybe get past the back to Victoria. Thank you. Uh, two quick related questions. One is that to what, to what uh, do you think that it matters who sits in the White House when it comes to handling China and dealing with China on, on the diplomatic front? And the related question is, do you think that Chinese Americans support Trump? Because my understanding is that uh, Chinese Americans in the last elections for completely opposite reasons, either because they're very nationalistic or because they're really anti-ACCP, they both, both camps supported Trump. So how do you think, do you think that the Chinese American votes matter? <laughs> you want me to answer this question now? Or oh, whatever you want. Then, well, why don't you take these two and then we'll take, we'll see if we have to take uh, Okay, so very gonna... briefly, the CCP controls the Chinese society through a big network of uh, organization. They have only 90 million members, but those members are in control of all the institutions, all the, they call work units and the corporations, and uh, the, uh, uh, all the government officials are political appointees by the Communist Party. Communist Party uh, controlled in two ways. One is the parallel in the party organization and the government organization. The party org organization have authority over the uh, uh, government organization. Second is the personnel. Personnel um, control. All the government officials are appointed by the Communist Party. So this way, they control the whole government agencies and the whole societies. And at the grass level, the penetrated, organize all those social organizations the party controls. And for the Chinese Americans, I don't know. I don't know if all the Chinese Americans voted for Trump. I did not. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if I should answer that question in a detail, but I, I don't think I would not vote for him. Yeah. But for, maybe I add one point that you said that it doesn't matter to Tom or uh, whoever uh, in White House, the China policy will not be changed now. Okay, my question is about, uh, she's, uh, she's uh, China dream. I was in China three weeks ago and I was told that many young uh, Chinese uh, people don't want to have children because the future looks black. Yeah. And, uh, and also that... Uh, you, youth unemployment in China is 25%. So how does it 
look the dream to those young people who have to face the next 30, 40 years. That's very, very important point, yeah. Uh, and that, maybe this gentleman here can uh -huh. help. Yeah. Thank you for a very informative lecture. Uh, I have one question about your view that uh, China will be trapped in a middle income level, okay? I tend to sort of uh, disagree or question about this. A recent OECD report uh, tells us a much more pessimistic view of China. In fact, uh, even the fact that uh, right now, some 45% of China's young people don't have a job. That's exactly what he yeah, said. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, consumption level is 20%. Yeah. Is going down, and to me, in the, in the real estate is all bankrupt in the bubble. I don't think there's much future economically for China to grow. And uh, some of the OECD people point out two percent increase next five years. So I wonder, Kevin, uh, your comment about uh, uh, many World Bank people or other people say that. As long as Xi Jinping is running the economy, China will become impoverished, become a more poorer country. Uh, and, come and these two questions are united, so I put them together. Uh, that's exactly my point. China now is falling into the so-called mid-income trap, meaning that they cannot get above those uh, now 12,000. Uh, U.S. dollars per capita, not capital, uh, yeah, per capita income, uh, to join the rich countries club, which not in the near future or at a time soon. Because as you said, uh, Xi Jinping is making those uh, uh, stupid foreign policy, and also you said that the youth unemployment has been so high, people cannot find jobs in China. When I was in China last uh, two trips. People always ask me, oh, how about the American economy? Chinese propaganda portrayed the U.S. even in a much worse situation. U.S. economy in big trouble, Americans uh, violent, uh, gun violence, uh, uh, anti-Asian uh, discrimination, everything was so bad. Nobody wanted to even dare to go to the United States. I said, come to the United States. Come to look, look at. And, uh, but that's the way try to cover their own problems in China is very serious at this time. That's how you said the, the China dream for those young people. They don't see a future of the China dream. But I will also, I'm not an economist. I could not uh, say based upon very systematic economic research, but I was not say China economy will collapse anytime soon either. And uh, become poor, how poor, I don't know either. I talked to Chinese friends, Ordinary people, their lives are not affected that much. They save a lot of money. Chinese saving rate is so very high for the raining days. So although the economy is in big trouble, they cannot find jobs. I still China is consumption is going down, but Chinese people, not people still are okay. After 40 years of reform and high rate, 10 double digit economic growth, GDP is destroying everything, but still have a lot of things left. That's what I said. You know, I think that this point here is important that we should keep in mind that when I started studying China, the young people were so optimistic. Yeah. So optimistic, so excited about the future. And so your point has to be taken in juxtaposition to the past, right? To see people now saying, I'm being live flat and everything, that's just a, a sea change from what it was. So I think this is, it's not only where it is, but it's where it was in that fall. It's yeah. really shocked. Hey, thank you guys all for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.